Welcome to the Talk BD Podcast, where we break down the science and strategies to live well with bipolar disorder. Dr. Janine Austin, welcome to our Talk BD Podcast. It is such a treat to have some of your time this morning. Lovely to see you, Erin. Lovely to see you too. Funny fact, if I have my memory right, you and I both graduated from our PhDs at the University of Wales College of Medicine in 2001. Mm -hmm. True facts. Yep. Which would be 22 years ago. No. (laughs) Don't say that bit. (laughs) But we didn't actually meet on graduation day. It wasn't Mm -hmm. until we both moved to the University of British Columbia in Canada, worked together as faculty, that we got to meet sort of in real life. That's right. Yeah. Very funny. Very funny, really, in retrospect. But yes. Yeah. And now we won't talk about how long it's been since we've been here, right? No. Okay, no, that's banned now. <laughs> what were you graduating in? What was your PhD in? My PhD was in neuropsychiatric genetics, which is always an easy way to kill a conversation that you don't want to have by telling somebody that. Yeah, and then I came to Canada after my PhD to actually train as a genetic counsellor. So you did your training for genetic counselling after you moved to Canada? I did, yeah. yeah. So I came here actually as a graduate student, first of all, yeah. So training as a genetic counselor is a master's based program. So it's a professional program. And so although lots of people ask me, why are you going back to do a master's after you've already done a PhD? It's not, there's no going back about it. It's an, you know, my PhD in molecular genetics was very much all about, you know, being in a wet lab in a, in a white coat with my little blue gloves on, you know, and I don't know if you see pictures of people with pipettes, you know, these little tiny machines that move fluid around from tiny well to tiny well, that, that was what my PhD was really all about. And it certainly doesn't teach you anything at all about how to talk to people about genetics of conditions, which was what my genetic training, my genetic counseling training was really all about. So, yeah. But psychiatric genetic counselling. So that's what I specialised in after training as a genetic counsellor. Because so basically, there are genetic counsellors who work in a whole variety of different disciplines. There's genetic counsellors who specialise in cancer and cardiovascular diseases and dementias, prenatal, metabolic, you name it. There's genetic counsellors who specialise in different stuff. At the time when I graduated as a genetic counsellor, nobody was doing genetic counselling for psychiatric disorders. That was what I wanted to do, but nobody would hire me to do it. Have things changed now, an undisclosed number of years later? (laughs) (laughs) It's actually, actually 20 years later, almost exactly to the day, you know. So yeah, I graduated from my genetic counselling training in 2003. And it would have been literally around this time of year. We just had the graduation celebration for the current group of trainees. So, yeah, it's literally almost to the day. So, yeah, basically at the time when I graduated, nobody was providing genetic counseling for people with psychiatric stuff because people would give me two reasons for that. You know, when I would go and ask, you know, people in positions where they could hire clinical staff. And I would say to them, hello, have you ever thought of hiring a genetic counsellor to be part of your schizophrenia team or part of your bipolar team or whatever? I would get reactions that were usually along the lines of, well, first of all, there's no evidence that anybody with bipolar or schizophrenia or anything, there's no evidence that those people are interested in genetic counselling. And second of all, even if there was evidence that they were interested, there's no evidence that it can be helpful. So bye-bye. So yeah, nobody would hire me to do it. So I ended up falling into research kind of by accident. So that was how I ended up becoming a professor was because I started studying those questions. Are people interested in genetic counseling for psychiatric Mm -hmm. conditions? And can it help? Um, So that's what I've been up to since then, basically. So 20 years of that. So having spent two decades answering those two key questions, you know, do people care about getting it and does it make a difference? What are the sort of meta things that you've learned? I can summarize 20 years of my life for you in two words. Yes and yes. 
<laughs> Those are the answers to the questions. <laughs> essentially, time has not been wasted. Then, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Our talk BD podcasts are one avenue for Crest BD to open up doors of conversation to key questions. And we have some questions lined up for you today. Thank you to everybody who's provided some of these questions in advance to Jadine and I talking together. Some of them we've also taken from our popular Reddit Ask Me Anything event, which we do every year. And we see these perennial questions coming up again and again. So how do you feel about just diving into a couple of those, Janine? Let's do it. Okay, let's go. So first of all, is there a bipolar gene and how much of bipolar disorder is about genetics and hereditary factors and how much about other stuff? Love it. Okay. So let's get to the very simple, straightforward answer straight away. Is there a gene, a bipolar gene? No, is the answer. No, there isn't. However... Okay, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So I think when we think about genetics, we're used to thinking of genetics in a very black and white kind of way, in a sort of a very deterministic kind of way. You know, there are a few conditions out there in the world where you have a gene or a difference in a gene, and it doesn't matter what happens in the rest of your life, in your environment or your upbringing, if you like. If you've got that particular gene change, you're going to have a particular condition. So there are conditions that you might have heard of that would, you know, with names like Down syndrome or Huntington's disease or cystic fibrosis. And those would be some examples of conditions that are caused entirely by genes, a gene, right? And if you've got that gene, you're going to get the condition. What we know is that psychiatric stuff like bipolar disorder, not the same. Those are not genetic conditions, strictly speaking. What we call, like nerds like me, in call them complex conditions. And that has a technical meaning, complex condition. Complex literally means it, is, it arises as a result of the combined effects of genes, plural, many, and our experiences acting together. So it's not, there's certainly no one gene that is enough to cause bipolar disorder. There's, there's dozens and dozens of different genes that we can have changes in that can make us more susceptible or less susceptible to developing bipolar. But we also know that the role of our experience is also critically important. So it's not one or the other. It's a combination of all of that. What, what are you talking about when you use the word experiences? Yeah. So, okay, so I'm going to use some words that I hate for a second, just because I think it might make what I'm talking about a little bit more relatable. Okay. So often when we think about genetics and whether or not it contributes to a condition, people will say, oh, bipolar, is that nature or is that nurture? I hate that for a variety of reasons. One, because nature, it makes it sound like it's a foregone conclusion. There's nothing you can do about it. Out of your control, end of story, right? So I don't like that word for it at all. And number two, nurture. I mean, that just sounds like blaming parents to me and not even parents, mothers specifically, because the dads are never involved in upbringing, are they? No. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I really don't like the, the phrase nature or nurture. But so, so I talk about genes and experiences or genes and environment. It depends what your preferred terminology is. But when I'm talking about experiences, I mean, like literally, there are all sorts of different things that we know can happen to a person in their life that can increase our likelihood of experiencing a condition like bipolar disorder, right? So there's some really interesting evidence about you know, using certain kinds of drugs. Like if you use a lot of cannabis when you're young, then you have a higher chance of developing a condition that involves psychosis when you're older. And so, you know, that, that would be one example. We also know that, I'm going to use air quotes wildly here, stressful life experiences. Like, what is that? Like, <laughs> awesome question. Who knows? And the <laughs> Anyway, so stressful life events can be a thing that contribute to our vulnerability to developing something like bipolar disorder. And when people ask me, well, what what is a stressful life event? I usually turn that around and ask them because 
it's not something that we can objectively define for somebody else. Like your perception, your experience of what you're going through is the best benchmark to use, I think. So and my favorite example of that is I absolutely, I cannot tell you how profoundly upsetting I find moving house. Like in a very deeply, like honestly, if I could have my choice, if I had to move, I would like to be sedated and have it all done and set up for me and then woken up when it, like I literally. Like tele teleportation into the new place. Yes. Yeah. That, that's, that's what I'm looking for. You need to teleport your cats as well though, because they get really stressed and that adds <laughs> on this compound exactly. stress. Yeah. Thing, right? yeah. How, so for me, moving house is like literally one of the most profoundly stressful experiences I can have as a human. And yet I have a friend who in real life, actively enjoys moving house like she takes as an i know <laughs> is her name what's the name of the woman that organizes all the cupboards really well and is a huge influencer <laughs> it's not one of our mutual friends so it's <laughs> she she does she she actively enjoys it she looks forward to it it's a uh, time for like purging cleansing renewal she doesn't get so so anyway the way that my point is that the way that we experience events in our lives is a uniquely individual thing and so it's very difficult to say moving house that's a stressful life right. event it is right. for me it's not that's awesome also, what we think about as classically positive events, you know, yes. Christmas, having a child, you know, those things in themselves as well can be right. laced with a lot of stress for a lot of people. That's exactly right. And I think that, you know, and just to get really complex about it, I mean, we tend to think about stressful life events as being things that have a negative value to them in some way, right? And that's not necessarily always ne what happens, right? So one of my like enduring memories or takeaways, I guess, from interacting with people over the years was interacting with one young woman who was talking with me about how she experienced her first active episode of mania in the run up to her wedding. And so for her, like she was so excited about getting married. It was a, it was a really positive thing for her. But was it stressful? Yeah, it was. And that was when she experienced. So, so we think of stressful life events as being all bad. They're not necessarily, but, but so, so it's, it's really nuanced, I think. Yeah. So Janine, you know, we just had a deep dive into how complex and nuanced this relationship between biology and environment and stress and personal understandings of your experiences into play and the intersections between these. Over your career, have you found any ways to kind of describe that relationship, those relationships to people in a way that's really kind of easy access for them? Such a beautiful question, Dr. Mahalik. That's something you should ask. Did you like, did you like that segue? <laughs> so Erin is just setting me up beautifully for being able to share with you a visual analogy that we actually developed. So we developed it actually almost 20 years ago at this point by working in collaboration with people with lived and living experience of conditions, including bipolar, actually, and family members. Because the problem is, you know, as, as you said, Erin, you know, you and I are sitting here talking together about like genes and experiences and they work together. And like that all kind of makes sense, I guess, but it's hard. I find it hard to kind of like grasp hold of in some way. Right. So this visual analogy that I'm going to share with you right now is what we've developed as a way of helping to make it more tangible for people, I suppose. So the visual analogy concept that we developed is that everybody has a mental illness jar, right? So in the, in the context of today's conversation, we can think about this as being a bipolar jar, if you want, okay? So every single person has one of these jars, right? Everybody. It doesn't matter whether you have bipolar or not. We've all got a jar. And that um, for each of us, there are different kinds of factors that we can use to fill our jar. So in this picture on the right, you can see that we're representing genetic, genetic vulnerability factors that we were just talking about with little orange balls. 
And on the left, we're representing that environmental or experience stuff that we were talking about with these little blue uh, pyramids, I guess they are. Yeah. Let's call them pyramids. And uh, so this, this beautiful image was developed by my brother, who is a wonderfully talented oh. artist kind of person. <laughs> Anyway, so the idea is that you can the both of these types of factor can can be added into your jar over time, right? That's what this this set of images is showing. So that if we look first at the jar all the way to the far right, you can see that it's full all the way to the top. In an hour analogy, when your jar is filled all the way to the top, that's when we experience an active episode of some kind of mental health problem, like bipolar, right? So this could be, this full jar could be representing an episode of mania or hypomania, or it could be representing an episode of depression. Okay. So if your jar is full, you're experiencing an active episode of illness of some kind. So there's a couple of things I want to like make sure I point out to you here. One is that the, as you can see, the amount of orange balls in the jar stays the same over time. And that reflects what we know from reality, which is the amount of genetic stuff we have when we're born is what we're stuck with. We can't change it. Right. Uh, it's just what it is. But we will all have some. That's a really important point. We'll talk about that in a minute, maybe. But we all have some. So it's not just people who have bipolar who have some of this genetic vulnerability. But what changes over time is the amount of that blue pyramid business in the jar, right? So that can accumulate over time as we experience things in our lives. You know, like those, for example, stressful life events that we were just talking about. That would be an awesome example of something that can add um, blue pyramids into your jar. And so at a certain point, if you get to the point where your jar fills up, that's when somebody will experience a first active episode of illness. Got it. Cool. So far. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next bit, which is just what it kind of gets at what we were just talking about, which is that you can have, so it doesn't matter how your jar fills up. Your, if your jar fills up, then that's when you experience an active episode of a psychiatric thing like bipolar, right? So if we look at the two jars on the very far right, you can see that the top one has relatively large amount of the orange balls in it, the genetic stuff and a smaller amount of the blue pyramids, the environmental stuff, whereas the one on the bottom is exactly flipped. Little mm -hmm. bit of genetic stuff, large amount of environmental stuff. And this reflects exactly what we know happens in reality, is that people develop bipolar disorder as a result of different relative contributions of genetic stuff and environmental or experiential stuff. Right. right? Mm -hmm. The couple of things I want to point out really explicitly here is that, see that set of top three jars where we start out with just the balls and then the middle picture is where there's just a few of the mm -hmm. pyramids in there. Mm -hmm. You can get to that point and go no further, right? So it doesn't, even if you've got a lot of those orange balls in your jar, doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're doomed. It doesn't mean that your jar has to fill up and you will definitely develop bipolar. It doesn't mean that at all. Right. It might mean is that maybe you have a higher chance than the person at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so maybe you have a higher chance for your jar to fill up. Maybe you would have, maybe it would be symptoms emerging at a younger age. Right. right. Those mm -hmm. just take mm -hmm. less time for the jar to fill up, that kind of thing. Right. But for basically everybody has a chance to develop something like bipolar disorder. It's not just people who have, who have already experienced the diagnosis. Hang on a second. This is, this is what I'm trying to represent with this picture here. Look. So it's showing that in the population, you know how like if we were to get everybody listening to this podcast today um, to line up according to how tall we are, there would be some people who would be like really tall. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call really tall is over six foot three because I'm not really tall. I'm mm -hmm. less than five foot three, right? <laughs> I, I so you'd you'd end up with like a small number of people like this little group down here, right? Who would be really tall, and you'd end up with a small group of people down here who would be really short. I would be in this group, right? But most people are somewhere between five foot three and six foot three, right? right? That's what mm -hmm. this is representing. This is most people, mm -hmm. but and that same concept holds true for how much genetic vulnerability we all have to mental illness. There's going to be some people who have a lot in their jar to begin with. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some people who have very little in their jar to begin with, 
but most of us are going to be somewhere in this intermediate moderate range. Right. And so it just depends what happens to us during our lifetime that determines whether or not our jar fills up and we experience an active episode of illness. So people will often say to me, you know, well, how do I have bipolar? Because I know that it's, people will say, I know it's genetic, but there's nobody else in my family who has bipolar. So how can that be? And, and that, that's really essentially the answer. First of all, it's not entirely genetic. Second mm -hmm. of all, we all have some genetic vulnerability. And mm -hmm. so all it means if you don't have a family history is that everybody else in your family was lucky enough that their jar didn't fill all the way up to the top with an experiential or environmental things. It doesn't right. mean... That, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the... We, we also weren't very good at diagnosing bipolar disorder well, that, back yeah. then either. We're not that good now. Yeah, we've still got some ways to go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think one of the things I like the most about this model, I think it is really important to people to understand like, how did I get this? Because oftentimes, like when somebody's developed, been diagnosed with something like bipolar, what I've learned over time is that people will often, and, and, and just full disclosure, like I live with a mood disorder myself. So I have depression, I have anxiety, and I also have nightmare disorder. So the, the research work that I do is very, very personal to me. Mm -hmm. and I guess the reasons that it's so important to me to try and provide these kinds of answers for people is because they're the kinds of answers I would have wanted to have. Like, right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think when people have been diagnosed with something like depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, whatever, one of our first reactions is to tend to feel like, like we must be defective or different mm -hmm. or morally wrong or something or mm -hmm. like, you know like we we mm -hmm. did something wrong that meant that we deserve punishment or like we could have done we could have taken better care of ourselves to prevent it you know, prevent this in some way you know self-blame self-stigma self yeah all of that stuff all of that stuff and so i think that you know it is really important to understand like how these things happen because by having a really good evidence-based research-based you know, explanations for why we've, we've found that actually we can reduce people's feelings of guilt and that sort of thing, which is super cool. But it gets even better, you know, because we can use this model to help people understand not only how did they get sick in the first place, but how we can better protect our mental health for the future. And so that's what I like the most about this model. So can I show you that stuff? Yeah, I'm okay. glad to see that stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is the bit that I love the most. So in the context of this jar analogy that we're talking about, there are things that we refer to as being protective factors. And so what they do in the context of this model is they stack on top of the jar, making it taller so that mm. the jar can accommodate more experienced stuff or environmental stuff without getting full. So you can't change the amount of genetic vulnerability in your jar. We talked about that, right? And that's what this picture is showing again. You can't change the amount of orange balls. And we're going to talk about what you can do to change some of those blue pyramids, the environment stuff in a minute. But I think what I like even more than that is the protective factors, which make the jar taller so you can fit more things in it, basically. Because remember, the jar has to be full in order for you to be actively experiencing an episode of illness. Right. So, yeah. So first of all, like, even if you've experienced a first episode of something, you've experienced a period of mania, you've experienced a period of depression, that means your jar was full, right? For lots of people, including me, right, I'm not depressed today. I'm not currently depressed, which is awesome, frankly. So that means that my jar, although it has looked like the one on the far left, it's not looking like that right now. Okay. So how, d how does it get from this, this state to a state where it's not full all the way to the top? There's a couple of ways that we can make that happen. One is by removing some of these, these blue pyramids from the jar. And that can be more or less difficult, depending on what the blue things are we're talking about, right? So, you know, so for example, in some, for some conditions that are psychiatric, there's really good evidence, for example, that if you experience a, a check, uh, excuse me, a head injury in childhood, that right. can increase your risk of some kinds of psychiatric conditions in later life, like schizophrenia, for example, mm. right? 
we cannot go back in time and change the fact that that happened. Right. Right. That, yeah. The blue thing that's in the jar. Right. I, I was in the example that or possibility running through my head was childhood abuse or neglect. Wow. Right. That isn't something that we have any control over, but can really. Yeah. 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 So, so some of those things are not things that we can go back and change the fact that they happened to us. We cannot. Mm -hmm. Right. There may be, there are things, of course, that we can do in terms of like, Mm, e easing the effect that they have on us in a date. Like if we're lucky enough to have a therapist and that sort of thing that we can work through some of that trauma with, then that can be a super helpful thing. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, so there are some things that are just blue triangles that are in your jar. That's it. Right. Right. But sometimes there might be some blue triangles that we can think about trying to remove. Examples would be stuff like if you're in a, current situation which is highly stressful there may be some circumstances for some lucky people where you can remove yourself from that environment please know i am not diminishing the significance of what i'm talking about i am not but it you know it for some people in some circumstances that can be possible can you give yeah. us a concrete example of yeah for sure like let's say we're in a work situation where we're just feeling like really devalued, really overstretched, really, you know, dehumanized by what you're doing. If you're fortunate enough, you might be able to look for and find an alternative place of employment where you don't feel like a human cog, you know, where you feel, where you feel like, you know, a valued, valued member of society who's part of, you know, contributing something valuable. So, so that would be an example. Another example would be, you know, we, you talked about trauma and abuse, Erin, you know, sometimes you know, we find ourselves in abusive relationships as adults. So removing yourself from a situation like that is profoundly difficult, profoundly difficult. But yet, if, if one is able to, then that obviously can be a way in which, you know, you know it, it's, it's a way to a clear, clear skies for, for many, many things, essentially. Mm -hmm. So those would be some examples. However, as we've been discussing, removing some of the some some of those blue things aren't going anywhere because you can't do anything about them, and some of the things are really difficult to remove. So, and that all feels really kind of depressing, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, so, what? So, so great. So then, what kind of thing? Well, that's the good bit. That's why I love the protective factors so much, because what that's about is instead of trying to remove the things that are making the jar full, we're adding tall, you know, tallness. <laughs> we're adding capacity to the jar you know what i mean we're making space in the jar in a different way yeah um, it's a strengthening and resiliency wow. kind of model right yeah exactly so you know we use example examples of protective factors would be things that we've got really good evidence for like you know good quality regular sleep yeah uh, social support mm -hmm. really important Regular good quality nutrition, if you can, right? Exercise. Exercise. That. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, you know, and then for people like me who've been diagnosed with a psychiatric condition and who are lucky enough to find a medication that works for them, then medication can be a really profoundly important ring on top of that jar. That's how I, I'm lucky enough to experience my medication. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so through all of these, and, and obviously finding more effective ways to manage the stress that we experience can be a really good protective factor too. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole bunch of things that we can do to add these rings on top of our jar to make it taller so it can, com it can accommodate more of this environmental stuff without getting full. And I think that is really like, it's really empowering. It makes me feel, knowing that makes me feel like there are things I can do and I'm not just a victim of whatever is going on in my, in my brain, you know, with, with my depression. I don't, I know, I want people to know this, right? I am not saying, nobody is saying, it's incorrect to say that anybody has the power to prevent an episode of mental illness. No, that's not it. This is literally just about reducing the chance, essentially, right? There's nothing foolproof here. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so this is no cast iron guarantee, but these are just things that, that, that we can employ that are sort of low risk, if you like, 
that we know work and that combined in my experience can make a really, you know, positive difference to, to how we manage these things. Right. Yeah. Beautiful visualization and explanation of that complex stuff that we talked about, Janine. Thanks for walking us through that. <laughs> no problem. My pleasure. But and my so we, we talked about psychiatric genetic counselors. Is this the type of thing, if you were to see a psychiatric genetic counselor, that you would be working with? Exactly. Right. So, so loads of people, most people, in fact, completely have wrong ideas about what genetic counseling is. When they hear the words genetic counseling, I think people tend to imagine, oh, well, that's something that you do if you're going to get a genetic test or... That's something that you do if you're pregnant and you know you want you might have a baby that has a higher chance of having Down syndrome or something like that. And sure, you can you, genetic counseling can handle those things, but there's way more to it than that. Mm. You know, if I were to summarize, summarize what it's really all about, um, genetic counseling is about helping people to make meaning out of genetic information, right? And that's what we've been doing just now. It's not only genetic information, but genetic information is part of the JAR model that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And the other thing it's about is it genetic counseling is about counseling. It's mm -hmm. about it's about providing support to people in, you know, using genetic information in a way that fits with their values and their needs and their wants that allows them to manage their health, you know, especially right. in situations where there's uncertainty which there certainly is in the context of bipolar disorder. Yeah. So you mentioned two things there that I want to pick up on because they map perfectly onto questions that we've had com coming in. Uh, first of all, you mentioned, oh. uh, thank you for the segue, but then you mentioned testing. And that's a question that we get again and again. This yeah. one says, you know, are there reliable genetic tests for diagnosing bipolar disorder? And then the second question we have that's related is what about testing for, you know, the, the way in which you might respond to different medications, yeah. bipolar yeah. disorder? Yeah, I love that people have identified that those are two different questions because they are two different questions. Mm -hmm. So let's tackle the first. Let's do the first one first, shall we? Uh, logically. <laughs> <laughs> so that question was about, you know, can you get, a, I think the question was reliable genetic test. It was, yeah. yeah reliable genetic test for bipolar disorder. And uh, so the first thing I'm going to ask our listeners, viewers to think about is the JAR model that we just talked about, right? And I, what I'm hoping is that people might be able to answer that question for themselves intuitively based on what we just talked about. So if we know that bipolar disorder arises not just as a result of our genetics, but as a result of genetics acting in combination with our experiences, then that tells us straight away that there ain't no genetic test that's going to tell us for sure whether or not we're going to develop bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so if that's what the question asker means by saying, is there a reliable genetic test? Then the, like, so is that, so I'm going to interpret that to say, by saying, is there a genetic test that will tell me wh whether I will or won't? No, there isn't. And I'm just going to stick my neck out there and say, and there won't ever be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because these are not just genetic conditions, right? There's more to it than that, as we've been discussing. So, but if you mean, is there a genetic test that I can believe in that will tell me what my chances of developing bipolar disorder? That's a different question. And there's a bit of a different, sort of a different answer to that one. So at the moment, if you go to a doctor and you were to ask if there's, can I have a genetic test to see what my chances of having bipolar disorder? They will say no. There isn't. Okay. However, there are tests that you can access all by yourself without a doctor online by paying for them mm -hmm. that will give you information about that. Now, I'm just going to put some really important caveats around it. Okay. So, th so th that kind of testing we refer to is often, it's all often called polygenic risk score testing. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex mouthful. All it means is polygenic means lots of genes, okay, and then risk risk score is kind of obvious, I suppose. So it's 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 a it's a risk score based on testing lots of genes is the upshot, right? 
So, and you can, you can, if you're motivated, you can find ways to get that online for things like bipolar disorder. And you may be getting all very, very excited right now and going, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Why can't I get that through my doctor? Shouldn't that be made available clinically? <laughs> no, because actually the amount of information it gives you. So, uh, so the very best risk score that we can construct for bipolar right now explains only a very small amount of our overall liability for developing something like bipolar. So it's in the region of five to 10%. Oh, interesting. So, mm -hmm. so the very best polygenic risk score we mm -hmm. can construct at the moment. Another example, depression, right? So I live with depression. If I wanted to get my polygenic risk score for depression, which I have not done, by the way, but if I did, uh, I may be at the very high end of the range. I may be at the very low end of the range. But And, and when you look at the results and you're on the high end of the range, that can be really scary. You can be like, oh my God, that's why I found depression right there. On the high end of the range. But the thing is, for depression, the best polygenic risk score we can construct only explains 3% of the overall reason for why somebody might experience depression, right? If you had a nice big rhubarb pie, it wouldn't even it'd be barely be a mouthful of that <laughs> rhubarb <laughs> pie in terms of the amount of. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> so, so those tests do exist. Are they useful? That is a very subjective question. For me, no, I, I don't want one. Like, that's my choice. But for some people, like, who really urgently need information and ways to think about stuff, like, they, they, some people feel they have some value. But really, I see them in this, but you can't get them clinically because clinically people have determined that they're not valuable enough to be offering, mm -hmm. right? So that's really the bottom line. And I, I think of them, you know, if somebody really wants to get one, who am I to stand in their way? But I just want them to understand what it means. And it does not, like, even if you're at the very highest end of the risk range, it does not mean that you're going to develop bipolar disorder, right? It does not mean that because we, it's genes and environment acting together, blah, 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 all of that stuff that we were just talking about. Yeah. So tread carefully in terms of interpreting those results. Very, very. Should and you? I, yeah. Yeah. So really, I think my point for listeners, viewers is going on this point is if you are wondering if there's a genetic test for bipolar and you would like to have one, I'm going to encourage you to reach out to a genetic counselor instead. And the reason I'm going to suggest that is because what I've found over the years is that often when people are asking these questions, is bipolar genetic? Can I get a genetic test? It's usually not like an intellectual exercise or a cognitive exercise that people are engaging in. Usually those questions or these needs for tests come from a place of, I'm sorry if this is hard for anybody to hear, but it's often coming from a place of being afraid or wanting a sense of control mm -hmm. over the future and that sort of thing, all of which are deeply, deeply human things to feel in the face of the kind of uncertainty around, you know, will I develop bipolar disorder because somebody else in my family has it, right? Mm -hmm. So, but a test is not going to say yes or no, it can't do that. So what a genetic counselor can do is help you work through some of those emotions and they can give you the best estimate of chance based on your family history, if that's what you want. And they can work with you around the jar model stuff about, well, okay, if you do have higher chance, then what can we do to protect your mental health going forward? Like what things can you do? Because Good point. The thing that we didn't talk about in the jar model Erin, was that when we were talking about protective factors, we talked about the generic things that work for everyone. But what we didn't talk about is how that there are unique protective factors that will work for individuals. So my one of my favorite examples of this is that I actually did genetic counseling for, uh, you probably know him, but he's a UK sort of figure in the media, Alistair Campbell. Right. And yeah. Yeah. So I did genetic counseling for Alistair Campbell, and there's a documentary about it on my team's website. Actually, if anybody's interested, you can watch it for free. And uh, so we were talking about his mental illness jar because he's been diagnosed with stuff and talking about protective factors and so on. And for him, some of his protective factors included Burnley Football Club, which is right. <laughs> not, not one of my protective factors. Uh -huh. and, Playing what, the football or that particular club? 
<laughs> Don't answer that. Rhetorical. Either or. Either or. <laughs> um, and, then, and the second one that he talked about was playing the bagpipes, which also is not one of my uh, factors. Right. I remember, I remember from years back, one of your protective factors, this boggles my mind, cave diving. I, I know that is very weird. Yes. For most people, that would not be a protective factor. But I remember well, you saying that silence, the peace and the solace that you would find in the dark, deep, right? <laughs> I see that now. Yeah. It's a photograph of a beautiful underwater cave environment. And Erin's right. So I am somebody who has a very serious anxiety disorder. I take medication for it. I carry Aspen around for when I have panic attacks. And yet, for me, being in a water-filled cave is my, like, it's the only place <laughs> I've ever experienced flow, you know, like right. flow. Yeah. So yeah. that's a good example, too, I think, of how unique and special yeah, that's those right. layers of protection can be for people. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so that's something else that genetic counselors can help you with is to help you as an individual identify those protective factors that are more unique to you. Yeah. Cool. And quickly, let's get to that question about uh, testing, uh, testing for uh, knowing more about oh, our response yeah, to medications. Sorry, I forgot about that one. I was so excited about it. I knew we were going to get there. No, but that, so, no, that's also an awesome question. So with this one, so, the, so just to back everybody up here. So what we know is that oftentimes when you're getting a prescription for some sort of psychotropic medication, people often don't respond very well to the first one that they try, right? And that can be a really, really shitty, shitty experience. I'm sorry, swearing, sorry, but it's necessary. Like it, it can be really bad. Like usually if you're at the point where you're going to try a psychotropic medication, it's because you really need it. And so having it not work is not great, let's just say. And that was British understatement. And then in addition to that, not only sometimes will it not work, it might also cause some really unpleasant side effects. So you're already in a bad, bad, bad place. And now not only is it not working, it's also causing you some additional stuff that you really didn't ask for. And that's not good. Mm -hmm. Right. So the idea is that we know that part of what contributes to the ways in which people differ in their response to drugs that we're prescribed is our genetics. So we know that, for example, we, there's lots of genetic differences that are super common in the population that change how we metabolize things like SSRIs or mood stabilizers, right? So... For example, like I'm taking escitalopram, right? I take that, no side effects. It works well for me. But somebody else of the same sex, gender, age as me, same diagnosis as me, being prescribed the same drug in the same dose could find that it gives them dry mouth and doesn't do anything for their symptoms. And we would like we would attribute in part that difference to, to differences between the two of us in terms of the genetics that we have that determines how we metabolize that drug. Right. right. So the idea of this kind of testing is, well, wouldn't it be awesome if we could test those genetic differences and see what drug would work best, ideally before giving it to somebody so you don't have to go through that trial and error process, right? And where is the state of the science and clinical application? Yeah. So state of the <laughs> moving along, moving along. <laughs> So, so, but I think it's really important to understand the background, right? It's yeah, really of course. Yeah. As, um, as an idea, like particularly in psychiatry where non-response and side effects is such a big issue. So to be totally straightforward with you, this area of research is most advanced in the context of major depressive disorder. There is research going on for bipolar. There is research going on for schizophrenia, but it's most advanced in the context of major depressive disorder. There's been now, three different, so the, one of the highest levels of evidence that we use in this area of science is a meta-analysis, which is where you look at all of the individual little studies that have been done, looking at, hey, if we do prescribing for somebody's medicine based on pharmacogenetic testing, does it make the outcomes better for the person? Mm -hmm. So you take all of the individual studies that have asked that question and you slap them all together, and then you look at them all as one big lump, basically. 
So there's been three of those kinds of studies, meta-analyses now, looking at pharmacogenetic testing for depression. And what they show is that there does seem to be an increased chance of both remission of symptoms and response to treatment. Those are two different outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. So, But there does seem to be an increased chance of, of both remission of symptoms and response to treatment if you're having a pharmacogenetic guided medication prescription. There's a lot of caveats around this though, mm -hmm. okay? One is that, so it, it's about, uh, you've, you're about 50% more likely to have some sort of treatment response or remission, essentially, which, sound, which does sound like a lot. However, there's a lot of margin for error in that number, okay? So it could be a lot less than that. It could be a lot more than that. We're kind of uncertain about how we're uncertain about how certain it is. Yeah. <laughs> I get what you're saying. <laughs> So, so, so there, there, there is that. There, another problem is that there is a risk of bias in the studies that have been published. So, for example, drug company, the companies that market the tests have been involved in some of the studies that have been published. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the reporting is not as straightforward as in the papers, is not as straightforward as you would have liked, for example, right? So those are, those are things that make us think of bias. Mm -hmm. So, so, so. I think the best way to summarize it is that it is a really active area of research. Um, the signs are looking really promising, but it's really complex. And so I think it's worth talking, you know, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I would suggest talking to a, like a pharmacist who specializes in psychotropic medications or a psychiatrist and, and, you know, to keep up to date with them about like what the evidence is showing because it's evolving really fast. Yeah. Mm, that's an interesting overview, Janine. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Probably time for one more kind of question area. And this again is a perennial one. And it talks, honestly, they're heartbreaking often, these stories that we hear and narratives from people with bipolar disorder who have made life changing decisions not to have children, to delay having children, real experiences of self stigma and fear and blame and shame. How, if you were working, you know, clinically as a psychiatric genetic counselor and somebody came to you and said, you know, I want to have kids, but I'm scared. Often they'll phrase it as I'm scared of passing it on. I've had a hard life and I, you know, I have fears around that piece. What would your response be? So, well, I mean, I can't, I can't do it justice, frankly, in about four minutes, which is what we've got left. Because honestly, that that requires that, that that like I like to be able to spend like a proper amount of time. Like you know, typically our sessions are in the region of about an hour to ninety minutes, depend because it's it's psychotherapeutic. That's what we're doing, you know. However, I will give you something. Okay, so in those situations, you know, oftentimes, sadly, you know, women in particular, I've found, are often told explicitly by by healthcare providers well, you shouldn't have children should you because you've got bipolar or, which can be some of like so profoundly damaging for people to hear i can't even begin to articulate the ways in which it enrages me so the way that i think about these things is as follows parenting is incredibly hard i'm not speaking from experience i've chosen not to do it myself because i don't think that I would be very good at it, let me just say. And I, I, you know, so I've got my own stuff, right? So I've made decisions not to have children for myself. However, the decision about childbearing is such a profoundly important and personal one. As a genetic counselor, one of my big values is making sure that people have access to the very best information that they can to make such important life decisions in an informed way, right? So where I usually start from is parenting is hard. It's hard for everybody. Everybody is going to have challenges, right? You, sure, you have bipolar disorder. Maybe it's going to be harder for you to parent. Maybe your child has a higher chance of having bipolar as a result of that. But on the flip side, first of all, you know in advance what one of your challenges is going to be. And that's better than being surprised by it. And because mm -hmm. if you know in advance, there's things that you can do to mitigate. So, for example, if you're somebody who has bipolar disorder and you are 
thinking about getting pregnant, et cetera, you might have a higher chance of having a, a mental health relapse in the period, right? There's things that you can do to plan for that, right? Go talk to somebody at the Reproductive Mental Health Program near you, for example, to talk about how to manage that chance with medications and so on. You can take medications while you're pregnant, actually. So it's it's not a blanket, don't do it. You know, you can absolutely take medications while you're pregnant. And there's things that you can do pre like preemptively in terms of like having conversations with your loved ones about like, if I'm in the period and you notice that I'm having a depressive episode, a manic episode, here's what I would like you to do, right? Mm -hmm. You write down those, those instructions so that, and that gives you a sense of control, even if you're not in a place at the time to manage it yourself. This is the earlier you saying, this is what you, it's, it's beautiful. And that in itself is empowering, I think, and, and, and seems to contribute to people having better mental health just because you feel more in control of the possibilities, you know? So in terms of managing those are some things that you can do. But then in terms of chances for children, okay, you have bipolar. Maybe your ch child might have a higher chance of having bipolar. Sure. Again, however, everybody has a chance to have a child that develops bipolar. Everybody does. Everyone, right? Your chance might be a bit higher. Sure. Yeah. But do you know what the good thing is? You know what bipolar looks like because you've lived it. And that is not a, not to be sniffed at, because if you can identify what it looks like, and many, many people cannot, for FYI, right? Many people cannot. But if you can identify it, that means that you can get help for your child in a timely manner. You can get appropriate help for them. And that means that the chance of having a really good long-term prognosis is increased. Right. So maybe there's a higher chance to have bipolar disorder, but you're really well placed to manage it effectively. Right. And every, again, just to bring it back to the idea that everybody has a chance to have a child with bipolar disorder. Right. So I think that for me, the way I approach it is if you want to do this, of course you can. Of course you can. Like, yeah, it's, there's, there's nothing to stop you. You know, if you're scared, totally get it. But there are things that you can do to sort of like mitigate some of that scared. You can do planning in advance around the pregnancy. Around You can do planning around like, well, what happens if, I, if I'm worried that my child might be starting to experience symptoms and so on? Like, you know, there are contingencies that we can put into place to manage that stuff. You can be a great parent with bipolar disorder. There's nothing to stop you from doing that if it's what you want. Beautiful. Janine, you've talked so much about the importance of accessing at the right point of time psychiatric genetic counseling to have these kinds of conversations. How would people go about that and what, what can access look like? Yeah. So we live in British Columbia, Canada, and here we established the world's first specialist psychiatric genetic counseling clinic. It's called the ADAPT Clinic. It's located at Children and Women's Hospital. And so uh, yeah, you can ask your doctor for a referral to that. And then if you're elsewhere, I don't, I'm don't. i sure that you probably have listeners, listeners from around the world. And there are actually clinics that are starting to emerge in places in the US, in the UK. People are starting to try and get this done in Sweden, in Australia. So it's, it's, it's coming. So what I would suggest is talking to your family doctor or to your psychiatrist or to whoever it is that you trust the most about some of these things and uh, and seeing what's available near you. That you can also look at, there's some information on the NS, NSGC stands for National Society of Genetic Counselors. So particularly for people who are based in North America, that can be a really useful resource. There's some information there about finding people in your local area. We'll make sure that we drop those links into the episode list for this and the links to your ADAPT clinic as well, Janine. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, your insights and wisdom. Been a real pleasure to chat with you as always, Erin. Yeah, thank you for having me.